Hey, this is DHG, and I'm going to be doing my conclusion of How Bad Is It? Medal of Honor 2010 Reboot. It's good. Now, I got a lot of flack back in the day for some pretty stupid reasons, but overall, it was a good game. It's still a good game. It's uh, a bit of a mixed bag when it comes to the campaign and then to the multiplayer, because uh, one's a little better than the other. I thought the campaign was pretty good. I mean, it had some issues with it. In particular, the controls could be a little off sometimes, a little un unresponsive. But then the multiplayer, I couldn't get any capture of that. I mean, there's still servers online, but no one's playing it because the game's really old and there wasn't that many people that played it in the first place. The multiplayer was kind of a unique take. It was developed by DICE. It ran on a separate game engine. This game, Medal of Honor, runs on two different game engines. A highly modified Unreal 3 and then Frostbite. One for the single player, one for the multiplayer. But the multiplayer played out kind of like a hybrid between Call of Duty and Battlefield. It was a really interesting take on... If I would have known that was the direction that Battlefield was going to take in the future, I would have been a little wary and voice my opinion in opposition to it, but for what they did in this game, it was pretty cool. It had some problems with it, with um, certain weapons being overpowered and people just camping to get the biggest score streak, but I mean, it was a lot of fun. You're going to have your problems with every multiplayer game. I don't think I've ever played a perfect one, and this one was no different. But the single player campaign... I really liked what they did with this, whereas Call of Duty and a lot of shooters just try to do the roller coaster ride from start to finish. This one focused a lot more on what your tier 1 units go through in battle. We're talking about SEAL Team 6. I mean, there's a whole slew of tier 1 units. A lot of them, you can't even find information on just because they're so top secret. But some of the ones that have been made public, either for the good or for, for the worse, are still Team 6, Delta, uh, the Nighthawks, 75th Rangers. And I used to know a bunch more of them. The Parajumpers, um, Army Combat Divers, a bunch of them. These are all the elite of the elite, the best of the best, and this game focuses on them specifically. I know Call, Call of Duty kind of does the same thing, and this has a Call of Duty arcade feel to it, but I think that this story does a lot better job at kind of showing what they may get involved with out in the field. I mean, obvious, obviously it's a video game, so they're going to have to make it playable and all that stuff, but they did a pretty good job with it here. And I had a enjoyable time playing through the campaign once again after last time I touched this was about 10 years ago and it's still a lot of fun to play through. So I'm going to get into the review itself. The graphics. I'm going to be covering the single player campaign here, not the multiplayer. But the graphics were pretty good. As I said during the playthrough, I was shocked to see that this was made with a highly modified version of Unreal 3 because I played this on PlayStation 3 and this isn't a phenomenon that was specifically beholden to PlayStation 3, but most Unreal 3 games, games made with that engine, just simply did not look good on PlayStation 3. They looked a little better on the 360. I mean, Gears looked great, but that was the exception, not the norm. Mass Effect also looked good, but most games just kind of look like crap. I don't think that either the 360 or the PS3, for that matter, <laughs> had enough power to really take advantage of that game engine. A good example of this is Batman Arkham Knight that came out on the PS4 and it used Unreal 3 and that game looked amazing. But they did a good job with it here. For all the crappy looking games made with Unreal 3 that was on the 360 and the play PlayStation 3, this one looked pretty good. It still had some of the Unreal 3 features, I would call them, such as the texture pop-in. It's not as bad as some of the other engines, like Chrome Engine had 
very bad texture pop-in issues. There's frame rate, um, some frame rate inconsistencies with the graphics or some screen tear, but overall the visual presentation was very good. You get into some really cool stuff in some of the later missions here. Like the lighting there looks really good. Later on when you're trying to shoot the dudes up in the cliffs. Yeah, you can barely see them because the lighting's so intense. I mean, it's definitely a good looking game. So the graphics were, they weren't top notch, but they weren't bad either. Controls. Controls got a little funny. Um, I didn't really notice a massive amount of unresponsiveness, but the... Let's just say, sometimes when you press the button it was more of a suggestion than a command. It didn't happen all that often, but it was just enough to get annoying. But overall, the controls were largely responsive. The X and Y sensitivity on the right thumbstick, which is critical for first-person shooter games, because obviously that's how you aim. It took a little getting used to. The dead zone was quite large, and you can't adjust that. Back in these days, you really couldn't adjust that in pretty much any game. But once you got used to it, I mean, it was workable. The controls could have been a little bit better, fleshed out a little bit more. The controller layout was... It was workable. Uh, double tap triangle to switch to your pistol. I mean, it was nothing big. The control layout was pretty good. It was based off of Call of Duty's control layout, which always works. Gameplay. Pretty standard first-person shooter gameplay in here. They incorporated some techniques such as suppression fire, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, let me get to the spot where you use that. Yeah, you got this machine gun bunker here. And you can't move forward and you can't advance the mission unless you really light that light that machine gun bunker up. So you just keep shooting at it and shooting at it and shooting at it. And suppression fire is something that a lot of military shooter games don't really take into account, but it's a big part of how warfare is conducted on the battlefield. Because if you're shooting at an enemy, they're going to be ducking for cover so they don't get hit by bullets, obviously. That means your team can maneuver while they're ducking behind cover, so you have to keep that fire up. It suppresses them. That's why it's called suppressing fire. And they did a pretty good job at incorporating that into this campaign. It's not a central feature, but it's nice to get <laughs> through a grenade to bounce right back at me. It's not a central feature in the game, but it is used. Other than that, you're clearing out villages from the Taliban. They even have, a, I would say at one point, the most unoriginal of features in the game, which is, oh my god, you've lost all your weapons. You gotta go get them. I mean, it's a classic. I don't know if they did that just because they wanted to throw that in there. Like, yeah, we, it, I mean, it's a classic. You gotta throw it in here. I mean, just about every first-person shooter game's had that at some point. But you got one of them in there. You got some pretty good sniper sequences. Where's friends from afar? Yeah. This starts off with a uh, pretty cool sniper sequence. So are you going to be picking people off from, I think they said about a thousand meters, 1200 meters, somewhere around there. Finding your targets here, there's your teammates. Finding your targets at that distance with a scope zoomed in that far is quite tricky. They give you a heads up on it, but you, I mean, it was really cool trying to identify your targets in this map. I forgot how good of a job they did with this. That was neat. You get to not really control, but you get to be the gunner on a Apache in this mission. That's always welcome. That's the only vehicle you drive in the single player campaign, which I kind of thought was odd because in the multiplayer, which once again wasn't developed by the same people, you can control APCs and things like that. But in here, you get to f be the chopper gunner on an Apache. A lot of fun to be had.
the sound. The sound was pretty good. I mean, some things could have been a lot better. Like, some of the weapons sounded a little off. They sounded a little, let's just say, tinny, for uh, lack of a better word. Didn't sound like they had much of a pop to them. But some of the other sounds, like when you start blowing up these buildings with your, I think they're Hydra missiles, and you start shooting hellfires at them too. I mean, it, it's got a great sound, especially the big 2,000-pound bombs that you draw from time to time. That all sounded good. The battlefield chatter is nice. You can hear the Taliban saying things in, what language do they speak? Pashtun? You can hear that. You can hear the radio chatter from your guys. It's a pretty immersive experience. They did a good job overall with the audio quality, but some things could have been a little bit better. Music. There's not really a lot of music in this game, but when they do enter some, it's usually at a triumphant moment like... Where's Billy of the Beast? Go to the end here. Yeah, you are completely besieged right here. I mean, you're holding out against... It's just your small squad, and it it looks like they sent an entire battalion after you here, which roughly about 250 people. I mean, they're just coming out of the woodwork to slaughter your ass in this one. And once the uh, Apaches show up, you get some music at the right time. And I mean, it brings you into the game. The whole point of music in a game is to bring you deeper into it for immersion. Indeed. Although it's limited in use here, they did a good job with it. Story. The story is one of my favorite aspects about this game. Being a first-person shooter, which you usually don't have that much of a story, this one was pretty cool. I believe that the person you're playing at on the SEAL Team 6 levels with Dev Crew, SEAL Team 6, whatever you want to call them. Ooh, a little bit of a graphical error there. That was my recording equipment, not the game. But the person called Rabbit that you play as, I understand that that was a real person and that some of these events actually happened, mainly early on in the war in Afghanistan. And the story focuses on all the shit that these guys had to do to try to I wouldn't say tame that country, but to get enough of a foothold where we could expand our operations. Now, whether you're against that war or for that war, these are the things that have to be done initially by these uh, Tier 1 units that get sent in first at their tip of the spear. I'm personally very against both of these wars, both in Iraq and Afghanistan, although Afghanistan was... We went there first for the right reasons, to knock out the Taliban. It was a terrorist safe haven. Um, but ultimately, we ended up staying there. We tried to do the nation-building bullshit. Same thing we did with Iraq. And how many people died? How many trillions of dollars was lost? And they... Ooh, my recording equipment's doing terrible there. But for what? I mean, you look back at these wars and you ask yourself, what did we get out of this? How was our nation any safer? How was the Western world any safer? And it's it's not. It's just simply not. We have more of a surveillance state than we had before all this crap started. We got trillions of dollars dumped into this with nothing to show for it. We've got soldiers killing themselves on... I mean, in exponential rates, the suicide rates for veterans of these wars is astronomical. It doesn't matter what country you're in, it's in all of them. And you just got to ask yourself, I mean, what was it all for? And this kind of covers it. I mean, it shows people in the field doing their job like these Tier 1 soldiers. And then you got people sitting on their asses in Washington, D.C. trying to call out shots when they don't have all the information available. A good example of this is... Something that goes on right here. Let me turn the volume back on. Do you have eyes on that convoy of vehicles in Bridge 160959? Yes, sir. Ready? They don't know if this convoy is friendly or not. Well, we've had reports of enemy ambushes in the area. Are they enemy or friendly? We're not sure, sir. And they're non responsive to our glint, confirmed? Negative, no glint. Are they registering weapons? 
high threat area with unidentified vehicles registering weapons. You don't have positive ID on those Re vehicles. Now, here it's known for certain special forces units such as the Green Berets to go in and work with the locals to patch up resistance groups. Now, this convoy of vehicles could be unresponsive for any real reason, and this um, they're going through the whole rules of engagement and all that stuff here, but you got the Washington General here trying to give out orders to, I don't know what his rank is, but he's the boots on the ground, one of the special forces, team leaders or whatever, and he's calling shots from thousands of miles away where he doesn't have the intelligence available that this guy does. And they fire on this convoy. They could be hitting their own guys and killing our soldiers. And that's exactly what happened, as you can see. That jackass right there should have lost his job, but the way politics goes in Washington, D.C., he'll get this guy fired, and he'll get promoted. That was my input during the game there, and I'm absolutely correct. So that's pretty much the story for this game. You go from different kinds of battles, you know, here's the 75th Rangers. I also said you're Dev Gru, which is still Team 6, you're also... Special Forces Operational Detachment 1, which is Delta. And you go through each of their different stories. I mean, you'll notice that when the Rangers, when you're them, you're doing a lot of shooting because they're kind of like America's stormtroopers. They go into a country, kick the door, and kick everyone's teeth in. That's her job. I'm going to move on to Stability and Bugs. I don't recall encountering any bugs bugs when I was playing through, at least none that was noticeable. And I'm pretty quick to point them out if I see something game-breaking or something that stops progression, but I don't recall anything here. It, every now and then you'll see some sort of a ragdoll effect go absolutely haywire, which made me laugh. I'm going to show one of them here. Yeah, just see that body go flying for no reason. You'll have some things like that, but it has no effect on the gameplay, and I thought it was quite funny. So it's a pretty stable game. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Okay, I retract that. I did encounter twice during this playthrough. This just... I just got reminded about this, because one happened during this level. Twice, my PlayStation 3 had a complete freeze-up. So I had to... I mean, if you hold the PlayStation button down, it works a lot like they do today with the newer PlayStations, where it brings you to another menu where you can shut the PlayStation off. None of that works. The PlayStation 3, when it had a freeze-up like this, you had to walk up to it, press the power button on the system itself, and then it would restart. Sometimes it would say, uh, you shut it off in an appropriate time, it has to rebuild the database and all that stuff. That didn't happen here, but nonetheless, I did have to do that twice when playing through this game. I mean, it's noteworthy. It didn't damage the save files, but it could have. That happened to me with Fallout New Vegas. I got a corrupted save file, had to redo like 50 hours or so of gameplay. So that's bad. It's... There's just some pretty unforgivable bugs and stability issues. So I would give that a... Let's just say an average, because that's not the worst type of bugs you can have, but it's still pretty bad. So retract my original original statement on stability and bugs. It's average stability. You'll have some issues probably. I don't know how it runs on the 360, but on PlayStation 3 I had two freezes. Opinions. Well, I thought they did a good job with this game as my rating for it is good. The follow-up to it, Warfighter, though, I'm going to have to do how bad is it on that one, too, because that was the last game that came out. I would like to see this franchise revived. I mean, with Battlefield out there, though, 
I can't really see EA putting two military shooters out there, but given how Battlefield has really gone downhill, and I mean, I never thought I'd say this, but I'm back to playing Call of Duty, that Battlefield's so bad right now, and I have hated Call of Duty ever since Modern Warfare 2, the first one, because it screwed everything up so bad, but Battlefield's to the point now where it's just embarrassing to even look at and play. 2042 is such a joke, and Battlefield 5 was terrible as well. So, they could revive the Medal of Honor franchise and pick up where Battlefield left off, or more specifically, make it more like Battlefield Bad Company 2, which had smaller maps, less number of players, but it was it was a lot tighter gameplay. I think Battlefield Bad Company 2 was the best Battlefield game out there. They could make a new Medal of Honor that's based off of that and still keep the big maps of the Battlefield series within the Battlefield series. Something they could do, but that would be two military shooter franchises within the same developer. I can't see them doing it, but that's my opinion. So, my conclusion for how bad is it? Medal of Honor, the 2010 reboot, it's good. If you can get a copy of it, it's well worth playing. If you can play it on PC, there might still be some servers online. And if you, I don't believe it's on Steam, but you could probably find a Steam community or Discord or something where you could play it online. It's well worth it.